share this chair. We say thanks to those of you who uh, were here yesterday, those of you who served in some capacity, whether it's praying or making meals or um, just loving on the family. We appreciate that. I know you as well. So uh, continue to pray for Debbie and her family. <coughs> oh, really mentioned uh, the really crowd of our church uh, come together. There's still things that we need to figure out as we go. Uh, like, uh, <coughs> couple weeks, that's what I hear. All right. Well, let's start our conversation. Let me uh, let me begin by asking you to do a couple of things. Hopefully, you have something to write with. So I'll give you a minute or so to write down uh, what is it that you're most proud of. So somewhere on the margin of your handout, if you don't have handouts, they're there in the back. Um, somewhere in the margin, write down what are you most proud of. As an individual, what are you most proud of? Maybe it's graduating from college. Maybe it's, I don't know, whatever it is. What is it that, what are you most proud of? Think about 30, 45 seconds. Think about what are you most proud of? Brag on yourself. What are you most proud of? <coughs> I put a good wife, a good mom, grandmother, and great Okay. <coughs> Sorry? <Okay>. Marriage? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Christian children. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Followers of Jesus. Good. And I'll add to that they're raising their kids in a Christian atmosphere. Too. Okay. Both close to the life. Good. What are you most proud of? Anybody struggle with that question? Why you struggle? Well, I can think of things I'm proud of, but I'm not sure they're worthy of being proud of. Does that make sense? Like it's kind of bragging on yourself in mm -hmm. one proud area, mm -hmm. and then I have other proud areas where I'm proud of someone in my life for what they have done. Yeah, but so I'm, I'm not sure. You specifically, you specifically. Right, what are you that, most proud of about your own? Something. What are you most proud of for Christian? I well, the first one would be my marriage for forty years to one person. Um, okay. Second question. I'll give you about 45, 60 seconds. What are you most ashamed of? Your life. Your just your walk. What are you most ashamed of? That's a lot easier to answer. Isn't it? <laughs>
which come up with? What are you most ashamed of? My past. <laughs> Anything specific? I could, but I won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's too shameful to talk about that. Yeah, let me put it that way. <laughs> most ashamed of? Not following God. I mean, not, not listening and not obeying. Okay. Disobedience, not following God. Mine's similar to that. I put not responsible enough as a disciple for Christ because I miss a lot of opportunities that I've had. Mm. Sometimes Me I'm too. scared and sometimes I don't realize it's an opportunity until I'm Away. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think if you uh, maybe just me me, but I think these questions are not easy to answer. Right? Um, yeah. I I kind of struggle with the first question along with Kristen and, and that man. If I'm if I'm proud of something, it's it. My brain goes to a place where well, that's just pride. That's just prideful. Um, but I know that's not the case. I know that I'm, you know, my identity's in Christ, not in what I do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the second question, what am I most ashamed of? You know, what am I most ashamed of? I could come up with a laundry list of things. I think we all could. Um, so that question is really, really difficult for me to just sit with. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to, especially when we're praying and we're, <coughs> you know, asking God to forgive us, then we just say something as, as uh, general as, God, forgive me of my sin. But we don't name those sins. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We're not specific enough to say, I'm a, whatever, I'm, I've got a temper. That, to me, that's specific, right? Yeah. Um, so I would encourage you, and I appreciate, I mean, I don't... I didn't mean to put anybody on the spot. But I think you do need to have somebody in your life that you say, uh, I'm just, you know, yes, I'm a sinner. We all know I'm a sinner. We all know you're a sinner. But let's, let's name the sin. Let's, let's say it for what it is. Because God already knows it, right? And, and why? If we have a relationship, if I, if I trust you with that kind of stuff, and you trust me with that kind of stuff, and we're holding each other accountable, then let's name it. Let's, let's say it out loud. That may be really uncomfortable for you. That may be really awkward for you. But I would encourage you to get into a relationship where it's not just uh, coming to church and doing Bible studies and going about your business and, yes, we're all sinners, but get into a relationship where you can, people know you and you know them. Um, why, would I, why would I bring this up tonight? Because we're talking about free will, right? What is, what is free will? Uh, we're not going to solve the world's problems tonight. Uh, we're not going to completely understand free will when we leave here, but I hope to give you some information that when we do leave here, then you're considering what I, what I have to share. Um, by the way, before I forget, next week uh, we're doing another hymn night. So Ann and Lynn will be leading us in a hymn night. So that's next Wednesday night. Please come and join us. Uh, 6 30. Um, so please come join us with that. All right, so let's jump in. Last week we talked about sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, versus what we call meticulous control, or at least what I call meticulous control. By meticulous control, I meant determinism. God, God is the chess master, God is moving the chess pieces around the board of, of the world. Uh, we talked about the danger of that, right? Because if you if you believe that that sovereignty equals meticulous control, then you have to, and when I say meticulous control, I'd like to underline that. Um, if you believe that God is, controls everything meticulously, then you've got a problem because then we have sin. 
we have evil, we have etc. Okay? And so we, I tried to give you an idea of what, what sovereignty is. That is that God is overall, God is all powerful, and yet God, uh, because of love, um, I don't think we talked about love a whole lot last week, but because of love, uh, there has to be a choice. There has to. You can't force somebody to love you. Um, does that make sense? You follow? There has to be free will. Let me remind you of a text from Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Jesus himself said, watch and pray. That word watch, sometimes I think we glance over it, especially in that text in Matthew chapter 26, and we don't really consider what watch means when Jesus says watch and pray. Uh, be aware. Um, be aware that Satan is out to get you. Be, be aware that Satan wants to take your soul and, and take you to hell. Right? So watch out and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then he goes on to say, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Is that your story? I mean, that's, that's who I am. Right? I want to do, I want to do the right thing, but I don't always do the right thing. Right? I know my sin. I can, I can declare that sin out loud. I can tell somebody that sin. I can confess that sin, first and foremost to God, then to somebody else that has my best interest at heart. And, and, I, and I, <coughs> I make a decision that this is the last time I'm going to have this conversation with God because, by golly, I'm going to overcome whatever it is. Right? Anybody else? <laughs> And then you're having the same conversation with God the next day or the next five minutes. Um, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why do you think we struggle like that? Why, why is it that? I think about, you know, there's a dichotomy in life where Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God, right? Peter says, this is not going to happen on my watch. I, you're not going to go to Jerusalem and die, right? Not, not on my watch. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Um, Peter says, I'm, I'm willing to die with you. I'm willing to go to the ends of the earth with you. You sure, Peter? Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times, right? Cuts off the ear of Malchus in the garden. He's pretty committed, right? And the next thing you know, he's rubbing his hands at the warming barrel saying, I don't know what he's talking about. You hear the, right? I'm committed. I'm not committed. I'm committed. I'm not committed. Get the idea? Anybody else live that way? I get it, but I... You don't I, have to yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> I think one step worse. See, when I was a teenager, after I got baptized, and I was very sincere, I looked around at the world around me and rejected God and said, that's wrong and that's not what I'm going to do and I'm going to do what the world says I'm going to do. And I did that for quite a few years. Yeah. But you wouldn't say you weren't committed when you first met God, right? You were committed? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely I was. And at some point, I didn't just be weak and fail. I said. Yeah, yeah. H-E double hockey stick. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yeah. I did. And yeah. I ran wholeheartedly. I, I get it. The other day. Jonah, Jonah's told to go to. I lived that way. He's told to go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. Adam and Eve are, are told not to eat from the tree of the garden. When you eat of it, you will surely die. What do they do? They eat from the tree, right? This is our story. This is all of us, okay? Don't you think too? If you look at the if you look at the warming barrel and the people he was around, he was committed to them. When he was with Jesus, he was committed to him, and that's the way we are a lot of times with our friends. It depends on what crowd we're with. Yeah. On who's who's yeah. yeah I, I think, our thoughts. I think peer pressure is a big part of whatever's convenient. Whatever we do, yeah. Whatever's Let's talk about image of God. Notice on your handout, uh, image of God. Let us make man in our image. I'll remind you of the text from Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. Um, Genesis 1, 
26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let, him, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Yeah, I suppose we could come up with, if, if I gave that, you know, pass out a note card and ask you to write down what does it mean to be created in the image of God, we come up with like 35 different answers. Let me give you a couple things that I think that we need to think about. First of all, it's reason. Uh, what do we mean by reason? And I'm thinking a little bit about, uh, about intellectualism here, right? Um, we have the ability to think, we have the ability to make decisions. In my mind, reason is the participation in and the reflection of the divine word. So we as the church, we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus Christ, when we say reason, and when we say we've been created in the imagio Dei, the image of God, we have the participation in and the reflection of the divine logos, the divine word. <clears throat> I didn't say we were God. <coughs> I said we are created in His image. More about that in a second. But I want you to hear the participation in the reflection of the divine logos. L-O-G-O-S. And that word means word, right? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That's Genesis 1 or John 1. 1. And, and John goes on and describes Jesus, not only the rabbi Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus the Christ, the one sent from God, the one who is the Word. If you want to see God and look at the Word, the, you know, the life of Jesus, that's the logos. That's what I'm talking about, right? The, the epitome of God, right? Right here in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Or in Romans, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, he says the first Adam, referring to Adam and Eve, but then he says the second Adam, referring to Jesus. Okay, The prototype. This is who we're talking about. This is Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Anointed One. The Logos. All right? So when we think about reason being created in, in the image of God, we have participation in and reflection of the divine Logos. I'm supposed to be Jesus to the world around me, in a sense. You know what I'm saying? I'm not from Nazareth. You know, let's, you know, don't, don't, don't go farther than what I'm saying. I'm saying, I'm supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ. You're supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ. Amen. We are ambassadors of God to the rest of the world. Is anybody confused about that? We good? Okay. So man has the ability to think to create, to make decisions, etc. Right? Uh, to think, uh, create, and make decisions. When you think about when you think about that, um, and you think about creation, right? We have the ability. We're we're, we're given the opportunity to um, to show that we reflect God. To show that we reflect Jesus. The only way that's possible is if the Holy Spirit has moved into our life, taken up residence, and we point other, other people to Jesus, right? What motivates you every day? Hopefully it's to become more like Jesus. Hopefully it's to point people to Jesus, okay? Questions about reason? We could say a whole lot more, but I hope that suffices. Second, the word re, uh, dominion. Um, most of you know, you've heard this term before, this idea of dominion, where it says, and um, God gave them dominion over the fruit fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What is dominion? We talked a little bit about this in our, in our Genesis series. Within creation, there seems to be some kind of hierarchy. There seems to be some kind of top-down. What I mean by that is God first and foremost, right? Then man, then the rest of creation, right? So if you, if you read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, the only 
part of creation that's created in the Imago Dei is mankind. And when I say mankind, I'm talking about male and female. Okay? So we are created in God's image. Um, my rooster is not created in God's image. Right? Or your pet, whatever. Okay? Why is that important? Why do you think that would be important? When, when, it, when it says that he gives us dominion. He says to, to Adam and Eve, you should oversee all. You know, Adam was able to see all of creation and name all of the animals. This is before Eve ever existed, right? Uh, he's able to name things, and then finally no helper, no suitable helpmate was found for Adam, and therefore God created Eve out of his side. Uh, but he's given dominion. He's given the ability to, and the responsibility to work, to oversee all creation. Why do you think the word dominion is important? Not a trick question. Come on, buddy. I can count on you, right? I mean, I'm not sure that we have in mind. And dominion is, is definitely a distinction and a separation between. There's definitely a, a separation. God has dominion over us and then ours over man. And, Typically, sin tends to be when we leave the pattern of where we are and choose to go towards the animal or choose to go towards try to be God and leave our place within that hierarchy, we find ourselves in a world of trouble. Mm. Why would you ever, I appreciate that, why would you ever go and share the gospel with anybody? Why would you ever go and tell somebody about Jesus? He commanded me to. Command you to? Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you have something good, you want to share it with somebody else. If you love them, yeah. if, if you love them, right, you're going to love them. I think about the John 13 text where he loved them to the end, right? Even though knowing what they're going to do, right? I think a part of it is obedience, but I think the greater part is we are created in God's image. What is God? God is love, right? If we're created in God's image and we get to have dominion over all of creation, what do we do? We are, we are in a sense, we are ambassadors from God to the rest of the world. We go and love them, right? Why? Because we've been loved. Why do you give grace? Because he gave grace. Because we've been given grace, right? Um, I think dominion is pretty important. We, we treat people differently because we've been treated differently. We, we've, we've accepted the grace, mercy of God. We can be gracious. We can uh, give mercy. Or at least we should. Human freedom. Um, what do we mean by human freedom? Well, a simple definition is mankind is free to choose. Now, are we talking about libertarian freedom? Are we talking about you able to choose everything? Uh, no, you don't get to choose your parents. You, you don't get to choose the time that you were born in, those kind of things. So there are, there are limitations, right, that are set by God. But we do have uh, the ability to choose. We, we have the ability to say, um, you know, I mentioned to those of you who were here last week, I, I've had a lady one time, she was adamant about God chose the blue shirt that I was wearing one particular night or whatever. Right? That's meticulous control. Uh, at Southwestern, we don't believe in meticulous control. That gives it's a it's a whole problem to have. Um, and so, mankind is free to choose. Um, I've had people tell me that, well, you either got a, a, an all knowing God, an all powerful God, but why would he why would he put that tree in the middle of the garden, knowing exactly what Adam and Eve was going to do? Because he gives them a choice. When you eat of the tree, you will surely die. If you do, if you do word study, you know, Bible studies throughout Old Testament and New Testament, uh, Testament alike, you will see the idea of obedience is based upon this if. If. If you will follow me, if I'm your God, right? Everything has conditions. But if you don't, then what? Then there's consequences for your sin. Okay? Does that make sense? So human life entails a relationship between 
Number one, man and God. We have a relationship between us and God. Even atheists, although they choose not to accept it, they have a relationship between them and God. They may not believe in God, but the only reason they exist is because of God. Follow what I'm saying? There's some kind of relationship. It may not be the relationship that it's supposed to be yet, but even an atheist, an agnostic, right, has a relationship with God, or they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be living. And then finally, man to man. Okay? If we're created in the image of God, we have a relationship one to another. We're created to live within community. We're created not to be rogue Christians. Those, that's an oxymoron, right? You cannot be a rogue Christian. You guys know what rogue means? You can't be rebellious. You can't, you can't go against... Um, uh, we're created to live in community. Okay? I'll say more about that in a second. But man to man. Okay? Difficult? Yes. Um, nevertheless, that's the way we're called to live. Okay? Um, we're created in the image of God. So let's talk about this idea of community. And I'm not talking about the piece of cracker and the juice that we drink every Sunday. But I'm talking about the ability or the importance of living together. I'll say that again. Communion, if I commune with God or if I commune with others, right, the church, it's the ability slash the importance of living together. So we call it communion when we pass out these emblems uh, that represent the broken body of Christ, the shed blood of Christ. But it, it shows the ability or the importance of living together. So I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or uh, communion, whatever tradition you were raised in or you participate in, um, it is this communion, communion with God, right? It's, it's sitting in the presence of God or standing or whatever. We're in the presence of God. So we're communing with Him. But we're also communing one with another, right? As a collective group. A baptism, uh, I always try to make a point to say, you know, this is a person who's being baptized, but we as a, a group, we are collectively understanding that I have a responsibility to that person. They have a responsibility to me uh, because we commune together, right? Um, they're created in the image of God. They've decided to follow Jesus. Um, they are staking a claim. They are part of the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And we have a relationship not only to God, but we have a relationship one to another. This is where I think the Quakers probably got it right, right? Where the... the not just the male on one side and the female on the other side, but they were sitting facing one another where they had to look each other in the eye and say, hey, I'm not only committing to God, but I'm also committing to you. This is the importance of community. This is the importance of relationship. Now, push pause right there. This flies in the face of society today. Why is that? Church membership is not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Loyalty is not what it used to be. Uh, divorce is at an all-time high. Right? People take their toys and go home. Am I, is this resonating with anybody? Oh, yeah. Why is that? Because we're no longer committed one to another. We, we, don't, we don't hang out. We don't, when, when times get tough, we... we it's a fight or flight kind of thing, right? Then what do we do? We, we fly. We flee. We get out. We run. Right? And, and it's, I'm not talking about just the church, although the church is included, but I'm talking about just individuals, any kind of conflict. I'm talking about, uh, I mentioned to you a couple of minutes ago about this accountability that we should have one to another, right? It should be male to male, female to female, because we're wired differently. But if I have your best interest at heart, you have my best interest at heart, we, may, we meet on an ongoing basis, and we're having a conversation about, hey, you, you mentioned last time that you really struggled with this particular sin, and you were very specific about that particular sin, and I've been praying about it, and I'm trusting that you've been praying about it. How are you doing with that? Right? That's, that's, 
That's a conversation that a lot of people don't have. They never get to that area, that, that uh, place in their life because they're not interested in that kind of conversation. Because that's real. That's transparent. Scary. That, that makes Satan run. Right? That's what I'm talking about. But all too often people are, you know, I'm, I'm getting mad about something, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> um, People go to court all the time, go in front of a judge and say, we've grown apart. No, you haven't grown apart. There's a sin issue somewhere. Well, he always, yeah, but what about you? Well, she always, well, yeah, but what about you? Right? Nobody wants to take responsibility. They just want to blame the other person and go the other way. Isn't, um, isn't our, as you're putting it now, our lack of commitment one to another, especially in this day society, isn't that really just a reflection of our commitment to God. We can't have a strong, we can't have strong commitments to each other and not have a strong commitment to God. Or we, we if we have a strong commitment to God, I will automatically have a strong commitment to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Because yeah. God's in. Yeah, we just, we just went through a series here, uh, Southwestern and First John and, and, uh, in the letter. And he says, it's, you can't say you love God and not love your brother. Or the book of James says, why do you, why do you say things one way? Uh, you know, you, 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 you say you love, but then there's this spewing all kinds of garbage out of your mouth, this unhealthy, um, I can't think of the word now, the, the fountain, the unhealthy fountain that comes out, right? It, Brothers, this should not be, James says. And I think you're spot on. I think it goes back to because we've forgotten we're created in the image of God, we live much more like the world rather than who we are as followers of Christ. Doesn't that all this make sense when you start thinking about what am I most proud of? What am I most ashamed of? Because see, people, they, they're, they live on, on extremes, right? Pride, too much pride is prideful. It, it, be careful, you're going to fall, right? But we're not talking about pride in self. We're talking about, look what God has done in my life, right? That's, that's what should be our motivation. Over here, if I'm so ashamed of something that I can never experience grace and mercy and love and all the things that God provides, then my identity is just as screwed up over here as it is over here. You see what I'm saying? So our identity has to be in Christ. Our identity has to be that we are created in God's image. Does that eliminate free will? Of course not. But we're created in God's image. And because we have this tarnished image, Genesis chapter 3, right? Then we have all these, you know, lack of commitment one to another, lack of commitment to the church, Selfishness still rears its ugly head. You follow? So communion is a big thing. The ability, the importance of living together. You'll notice on there a couple bullet points. Creation entails God creating man in his image. We already talked about that in Montiel Day. And of course God creating male and female. Um, well, let's say what scripture says, right? Why, did, why do you think it's so, I just think it's craziness that we have to, I mean, this is a safe conversation in here, right? Male and female and not pronouns and all the other kind of stuff that people are talking about. All right, so let me give you a couple of premises that I think that we need to get through pretty quickly, and I'll get try to get to number three so we can look at, but if I'm, if I'm going too fast, please feel free to stop me and we'll go back. Uh, first of all, human beings are created in God's image. We've already established that. Uh, they're freely addressed by God and free to respond to God. God tells Adam and Eve, there's a tree in the middle of the garden. If you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay? Um, freely addressed by God and we're free to respond to God. Right? There's nobody holding a gun. There's nobody telling you to, to, to do something you don't want to do. We're, we're free in that regard. Freely addressed by God and free to respond to God. Again, as we've already said, human beings are the only part of creation made in God's image. Um, as much as you love your pets, 
We're the only part of creation that is made in God's image. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, uh, that you may have life, and not just life, but abundant life, or life to the full, depending on what translation you read. So abundant life or life to the full. The question is, what is life? And John describes what life is throughout his gospel. Jesus says, I've come that you may have abundant life, or life beyond life, or life to the full. That only happens with Jesus, right? And also, God lives in relationship and calls us into relationship. I will say something about that in a second, so I'm going to leave that alone. God lives in relationship and calls us into relationship. I apologize that your handout is upside down. Uh, that was not my intent, but... Copiers work the way copiers do, so. And I wasn't going to make another 30 or something. Number two, being created in the image of God means we find our identity in existing alongside each other and with all creatures. Uh, again, we're created for community. We look differently. We act differently. We come from different places. Um, and yet, our identity is found existing alongside each other. I need you. I've said this before at Southwestern many times. Say it again, I need you uh, to speak into my life. And you need me to speak into your life. That's what the church is all about. That's the called out ones, right? As iron sharpens iron, the Bible says. Right? We need each other. Okay? As uncomfortable as that might be sometimes, um, we need each other. If we're really interested in becoming more like Jesus, we need to be living alongside each other with all creatures. Uh, throughout Scripture, communal living is emphasized. Those self-focused will die lonely. Let me say that again. Those self-focused will die lonely. You know anybody who's a nar? I wish Martha was here tonight, but I would ask her this question. You know what a narcissist is? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Somebody who looks at the pool and goes, oh, that's a pretty picture, right? Well, I mean, that's the whole, that's what narcissists did, right? If you know somebody who's so self-absorbed, who's so selfish, who's so focused on self that they're not interested in community, in relationship, they're going to die lonely. Somebody want to push back on that? I'm like 99.9987% about that. I think the reason that people are so caught up in themselves is because they're lonely. Because I, I mean, yeah, there's some, there's some evil, uh, you know, uh, I think of secular humanism and I think of worship, worship of self. I, I think that's all about being lonely. I think that's all about trying to, you know, this guy over here who's trying to uh, do something just right the first time and becomes very prideful. He's lonely. Person over here who can't experience grace and love and mercy <coughs> by God. He's lonely. Right? And the selfish person who can't get past self. Um, I heard an old song uh, the other day. I hate the song, but it's a uh, Carly Simon, isn't it? You're so vain. You're so vain. Mm -hmm. You must. You must think this song is about. Look at all y'all worldly people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that's that's the idea of your narcissist. You're so focused on on self. You're so caught up in in self uh, that you're lonely. There, yeah. Think about that and push back on that if you if you want. But those self focused will die lonely. We are relational beings. We live in dialogue. And what I mean by dialogue is not just conversation one with another. I'm talking about dialogue is partly prayer. Uh, Elva, when we come and pray on Sunday mornings, we're, we're having a dialogue with God. Hopefully we've done it before Sunday mornings. But we're dialoguing with God. We're dialoguing with one another. Um, but we're also doing that the way we live our lives. You know, it's not just our voices. It's not just what we say. It's not just what we listen to. It's how we live our lives. 
We're to be a living sacrifice. That's the same language Paul would use in Romans chapter 12. Be a living sacrifice. That would be the dialogue that I'm talking about. Next bullet point. There's a reason that God creates a quote-unquote helpmate for Adam. No suitable helper was found for Adam. Likewise, Adam is a helpmate for Eve. We are wired differently. If you haven't figured that out by now, we're wired differently. <laughs> um, so so we, we complement each other. I didn't say I made her whole or she makes me whole. I think that's bad language. But I've, I've seen that a lot. Uh, oh, that person makes me whole. No, no, no. You're, you're worshiping the person. God makes you whole. Yeah. Right? But God can use a person um, to be your helpmate. And you need to be the helpmate for somebody else. Now, I, I would say, somebody would say, well, what about single individuals? Well, um, single individuals, same thing. Wholeness comes from God. Healing, healing comes from God. Right? Um, and there are still platonic relationships. Not marriage, but platonic relationships where there's still helpmates. There's still... And then the last bullet point under number two is this word perichoresis. We've talked about this before. It means a round community. This is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. No hierarchy in the Godhead, um, but perichoresis means in community. And Jesus says, if you've seen me do something, you've seen the Father do the same thing. Um, I will tell the Father, ask the Father, the Father will send the Holy Spirit, paraclete will come. Uh, John chapter 14, you get the idea. So God's, we're created in the image of God. God is community. Therefore, we're created around community. Okay? Number three. Being created in the image of God is not a state or condition, but a movement with a, with a goal. Um, what does it mean to be the hands and feet of Christ? I think that's a Sunday school conversation that we, you know, we said, well, let's just go be the hands and feet of Christ. We say it every Sunday here, right? Love God, love people. What does that mean? What does it mean to... It's not a state or condition, but a movement with a goal, right? How, are, how am I going to love somebody today? Uh, how am I going to love God? Well, by loving somebody. Even the unlovable? Yeah, even the unlovable. Jesus touches the leper. Um, people that nobody else wants to love, right? That's what we're called to do. So it's not a condition, but a movement with a goal. Human beings are restless for a life fulfilled, yet not realized. Let me say that right after the semicolon. Human beings are restless for a life fulfilled, yet not realized. What I mean by that is we're in the garden. We eat from the tree in the garden. Uh, we've always wanted to get back to the garden, but there's this flaming sword that goes back and forth. We can't get back into paradise because we've been banished from paradise. So there's always going to be this restlessness. There's an old hymn, and Andy can help me out with this title if you know it, but it, it may be the title. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. That kind of idea, right? There's some kind of, what's the old King James Version word? Unction. There's some kind of desire that I want to get back to God, right? I want to, you know, and whether you're a follower of Jesus Christ or somebody who's not a follower of Jesus Christ, they don't know what that is. But that desire is to get back to God, is to get back to the presence of God, Garden of Eden. Okay? Does that make sense? So there's this, there's this desire, complete desire. It's not realized yet, but when restoration happens, it will, it will be fulfilled. Let me read a text to you. Um, Hebrews chapter 13. I'm not going to read all of this because of time, but I will point out a couple verses. Hebrews 13. For those of you at Southwestern, we're going uh, to preach through Hebrews in the fall. Um, so you can start reading now if you'd like. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. This is the end of the book. And the writer says, For here we are, uh, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. In other words, this is broken. We, re we recognize this is there's something flawed about this. Whether I'm looking in the mirror or I'm looking out here, there's something flawed about this. But there's this city we've been promised in the future. Um, this is a city that's to come, right? The new heaven, new earth is what Revelation talks about. 
But through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. In other words, where's restoration going to come from? It's not going to come from anything here on cre in creation, anything on the wor in the world. It comes from God and God alone. So don't neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices of pleasing to God. Uh, obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for there, there would be no advantage to you. Pray for us. This is the benediction, of course. Pray for us that we're sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may restore, be restored to you sooner. And then it says in verse 20 and 21, May the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What we see right now, uh, Paul says, we see dimly. But when Christ returns, or when we go to meet Christ, uh, we recognize things completely, right? This is uh, the idea of, of glorification. We've talked about those three words. Justification, no longer guilty. Sanctification, I'm becoming more like Christ. Glorification is I have become more like Christ. I can see things the way they're supposed to be. I had no idea that's what faith meant. I had no idea that's what grace meant. I had no idea how good, how gracious, how loving God was. But one day we will. Follow? Uh, how many of you understand baptism completely? Good answer. <laughs> right? But we will one day. You get the idea. Okay? So this is not our home. Uh, I love that old hymn. Right? And I, I mean, that's biblical. That's scripture. Um, you made a story, Augustine, who's a bishop of Hippo, 4th uh, century Hippo in Africa, um, said this. He's attributed to this great quote. You, God, have made us toward yourself. Our hearts are restless, there's that word, until they find rest in you. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, man, I've tried everything. I've tried wine, women's song, jobs. I've tried everything. And you know what it is? The whole duty of man is to worship God. That's the whole duty of man. That's the, that's the end result. This is what I've come to realize. Okay? And then a couple things about fallen humanity um, before we finish. Could sin be described as the denial of our restlessness? This is kind of what Aaron was talking about earlier, I think. Could sin be described as the denial of our restlessness to God and our need for His grace? Um, let me say a word about that for a second. Some of you probably know the word sin is amartia, and it means missing the mark. So when you think about the bullseye, uh, you've all seen the targets, right? Whether it's a, an arrow or, you know, at the range, gun range, whatever. Uh, the bullseye would be God's will. Anything outside the bullseye would be missing the mark. That's what sin is, uh, scripturally. Spell Amartya. Huh? Spell Amartya. Amartya? Yeah. The H is silent, so H A M A R T I A. H A M A R T I A. The H is silent. And there's an accent on the end if you want that to. Amartya. It means missing the mark. Um. So could, could it be that sin is described as the denial of our restlessness? In other words, uh, I know what I should do. I, I know, I, know uh, I should not murder. But I've been angry enough with my brother to murder him. Right? That would be sinful. I know that I shouldn't look at a woman lustfully. But I, you follow what I'm saying? Right? So all this stuff of saying, yeah, it's easy for us to answer the question, well, I... I, it's pretty easy for me to come up with things that I'm ashamed of. This, this, is, this is sin, right? That's the denial of the restlessness to get back to God. So in other words, although we know what we should do, why do we continue to choose wrongly? Why do you have to go back to God and say, here I am again, God? Right? We're having, and David did the same thing, man after God's own heart. 
Read the Psalms. Right? We're having the same conversation we were having yesterday, God. Why? Because the heart is desperately wicked. Because we've been flawed from Genesis chapter 3. Okay? The fall of man was the fall of creation. Everything is flawed. Okay? Does that let us off the hook? No, it doesn't let us off the hook. Um, but we have to be aware of it. Right? We have to, to understand grace, we have to understand the situation we're in. Okay? I want you to think about Judas for a second. Uh, Judas, who uh, was an apostle. Nobody can convince me that Judas was not committed for a time. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? So, so when I asked you a little ago, you were, you were committed, yes. But then you followed the world. No, your word is not mine. That's my, that's my testimony too, right? I was baptized at eight years old. I didn't become a real follower of Jesus Christ until I was in my early 20s. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? And there's this Judas who is called by Jesus to be an apostle. And he's trusted so much that they give him the money bag and make him the treasurer. He's at the big meal where Jesus goes around and washes the feet of Judas. He tells Judas, I think, you are great management here, right? Jesus looks at Judas and says, what you do, go do quickly. He doesn't rat him out in front of everybody else. In fact, the Bible says that everybody else thought he was going to take care of the poor. Right? He doesn't say, Judas, what do you think you're doing? It's still Jesus, right? So he says, what you do, go do quickly. Um, Can I ask a question about that? Because isn't there a scripture that talks about, you know, when I asked who is this, and he said, well, it's the one that dips his hand in the blood, and, and, and Judas is the one that dipped his hand. So he was telling them who it was going to be, but none of them caught it. I don't quite fully get that. Yeah. Um, I think it goes back, personally, I think it goes back to community. I think they've all dipped their hands in the, in the cup, right? When they're, when they're passing the cup around, and he's saying... Take eat this is my bread, my body, which is broken for you. Take and drink. This is the cup that is broke, that's been shed for you, or whatever. And he's taking it to a whole other level. And they've all participated in that, right? Um, yes, Judas, the one we think of, is always the one that we throw under the bus. But wasn't it Peter? Wasn't it James? Wasn't it John? Didn't they all scatter like a covey of quail? Mm -hmm. I think I'm right. I mean, check me on that, but I think I'm right. They were all gone. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, Aaron, but yeah, I'm, I'm. if not, I can try in a minute. So I, I think Judas, I think Judas was committed. I think Judas is, is uh, you know, I've heard people tell me, well, Judas would have never done what he did if he was a real follower of Jesus. No, he was a follower of Jesus for a time. But then he tried to uh, promote his own agenda over the agenda of Jesus. Well, then you would have had to say, that same person would have to say, well, Peter would have never did what he did. Yeah, exactly. I would have never did what I did. Well, they would say, so they would say that Peter, Peter went out and wept. Peter was remorseful. Judas never was remorseful. Judas went out and you know, hung himself, and his guts were all over the ground. And Yeah, I've heard all kinds of things. But, but I, I think... To, he tried to... What's that? He tried to give him the money back. He tried. Yeah. yeah he, did. he was remorseful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's. I think he's sorry. I think he's sorry that he sold Jesus out for thirty pieces of silver. I would agree with that. I, I don't, I'm not sure that he's remorseful to the extent that he's going to. I didn't mean to minimize what you said. I don't think he's remorseful to the extent that he receives the grace of God. Or he was you married. and I don't know that for sure. We don't. I don't know that for sure. I don't know a whole lot. <laughs> I don't either. But. Number two, how do we as sinful beings uh, live in community with other sinful beings? Uh, we're creating the image of God. We already talked about that. We're talking about being created in, in uh, community, in relationship. Um, we're flawed individuals. Why do we need healing? Why do we need a God who interacts with creation? A broken creation. 
at that, to include simple beings. This is the hard part, right? This is the this is where grace comes in. This is where I love you, we agree to disagree, but I love you. That's hard, that's hard work. Jesus says, don't just tolerate your enemy. What does he say? Love them. What does it mean to love them? Right? Pray, pray for your enemy. You know, that's hard, that's hard. You know? That's what we're called to do. We're called to do hard stuff. Number three, if made in the image of God means being open to God's rule. If being made in the image of God means being open to God's rule, sin is the denial of destiny planned by God. True or false? True. Does everybody hear that? If made in the image of God, I think we've all established that, means being open to God's rule. That means I'm not God, He is. It's no longer I who lives, Christ who lives in me, Paul would say. Sin is the denial of destiny planned by God. God has a plan for my life. God, God establishes the, um, the time that I will live. God has a plan for me. That doesn't mean he has meticulous control, but he has a plan for me. And I can deny that plan. That's free will. That happens on a day-to-day -day basis, by the way. I don't think he planned for us to sin. I'm sorry? I don't think he planned for us to sin. No, not at all. I don't. Don't hear me say that. No, I, I didn't think you were saying that. But I, I didn't think you were saying that, but that's the way I feel. Is that I don't think he planned for us to sin. No, he knows he we're going to sin. He, he, knew knew we're going to. He, he knows. He knows, he knows we're going, going to sin. He plans our destiny. He that we wouldn't go eat off of the apple of the tree. Correct. Yeah, he plans. He plans our destiny. What's our destiny? At creation, what's the what's the go back to Genesis chapter one? Yeah. Living in the presence of God, right? Yeah. If they would have eaten from the tree in the middle of the garden, what would have happened? They're living in the pre they're walking in the coolness of the day, right? They're walking with God on a day to day basis, right? They would have stayed there. Only in Genesis chapter three, where they eat from the tree, we have the fall of man. So God's God's plan of destiny is man in the presence of God. Um, no, we're not. He doesn't plan for us to sin. You know, I want to. Can I say something about? You know, she said we don't know where they, it, his repentance or what about Judas. Mm -hmm. But Jesus actually said, "The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed." Uh, good. It would have been, uh, been better for him to have never been born. Correct. So to me, that would. It was better for him to never be born than. It would seem like where his destiny would be. You think Judas had free will? No, most definitely. Most definitely? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in this, how we're setting up free will, it, it goes, what you said, this Word of God, He wants a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. But He's pure and holy, and He knew we was going to sin. But God has set up parameters. He wants, to, he wants us to love Him. That's why we have a free will, because you can't love somebody if you don't have a free will. Okay. That's why you can't, trees don't love you back, you know, because they don't, they're a tree, and that's all they can do. But have got a pretty good looking tomato plant, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but God has set up the parameters. Yes. And then He's loved us so much, He says, okay, I'm going to give you free will, but here's your parameters. You don't get to choose the consequences. Right. I've already set them in place. Yep. Yep. And so if you choose this, this is what's going to happen. If you choose this, this is what's going to happen. But we have free will to choose, but he's loved us so much he's told us what's going to happen. And we can get into a lot of stuff, but even Mickey Mouse stuff, like if you choose to wear a... a oddball shoe, you know, where you got two different pair of shoes on, you know, one from another group, now, you don't get to choose the consequences of that. Everybody else that looks at you is going to choose the consequences. Either they're going to make fun of you or laugh or cut up. You know, you walk outside with, in the cold and they're with, no, with just, you know, bare minimum clothes, you're going to get cold because you don't have a choice. Or you don't get to choose the 
glitches. It's already been set for you. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that he's loved us so much and died for us. And, he's, and he knows because of the deception, he puts life and death in front of us. And then he tells us, choose life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it all goes back to, I think you're spot on, Aaron. And I think it all goes back to being created in the image of God. No other part of creation is created in the image of God. I think that's key. So I'd like you to chew on that for a couple of days, a week or so. Next week we're back with uh, hymn night, and then we'll pick up our conversation in a couple of weeks. Fair enough? Mr. Lamke, would you mind praying for us, please? Heavenly Father, just thank you for the opportunity to come. And thank you for your word. Just thank you for my ability to lead us in this study. And we ask the Lord that you just guide and direct us as we go into next week. Into our future, we just ask you to be with us, and that we can understand the purpose of that uh, presence. And we ask the Lord now that you go with us as we go into our homes and into our communities, and allow us to love you and love people. We just thank you, just pray for myself. Thank you.